This is the Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund this evening, this Shabbos evening. And we continue with the reading of Lars Fischer's The Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State. And uh, we should begin with the um, lighting of the candles for Shabbos, uh, since this is the workers' first holiday in history. And so we say, Ruch Dadanai Eloheinu Melch here it is. Most of it. Okay. Let's start the reading. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, here it is. Okay. And there we go. Okay, we're at page 179. And we're continuing with Bernstein's dispute with Bax around the years 1898 to 99. I have argued that Bernstein's article, Das Schlagwort in der Antisemitismus, did more to cement than subvert the logic underlying the prevalent critique of philosemitism. This contention formed part of my argument that their critique of philosemitism was no pet obsession of Mehring's, but in fact widely subscribed to by Mehring's peerings, peers, <clears throat> including both Bernstein and Kautsky. Those in the know may have been a little miffed at that juncture, and I did not discuss the latter instances in which Bernstein made an affirmative reference of sorts to philosemitism. I alluded earlier to Jack Jacobs' suggestion that Bernstein's beginning, quote, dramatic revision, unquote, of his stance found its public expression, quote, as early as 1898, unquote. This was, in fact, a direct reference to the first of these two instances. Quote, as early as 1898, Jacobs wrote, Bernstein demonstrated that his position was now somewhat different. For the first time, he openly declared, quotes, it is for me a categorical imperative under the present conditions to be a philo-Semite in the face of any anti-Semitism, unquote. In what context did Bernstein make this remark? He made it in a footnote attached to an article that he published in the Nyazite in April 1898 to refute a critique by the English socialist Ernst Belfort Bax, 1854 to 1925. The main issue between Bax and Bernstein concerned the merits of colonialism as a means of spreading civilizationary values and hastening the process by which capitalism transformed the world in its image and hence propelled it towards a revolutionary transformation, period. Bax, <laughs> yeah, wow, willful, will, willful thinking there, wishful thinking as well. Bax maintained that the proliferation of capitalism beyond the developed European states and the U.S. would not hasten the revolutionary process, but only subject more and more of the planet's population to the misery of life under capitalism. The primary target of Bax's ire was Anglo-Saxondom. Anglo-Saxondom, by which he meant primarily British imperialism, but also U.S. American expansion, both in North America and beyond. To his mind, the world was threatened by an un unhealthy preponderance of the Anglo-Saxon race. Hmm. Yeah, I think so too. We are at risk of seeing the predominance of a single race, or 
nation as it used to be called a race because they didn't know what race was because nobody who knew how to write, you know, had any scientific education. <laughs> okay. Anyways, Bax wrote in the Nizite in December 1897, yet, quote, on the European continent, one has so far been so preoccupied with the Jewish question that one has given little consideration to this other race question, and yet its significance for the future is in some respects much greater. Unquote. Bax then developed this analogy at some length. Inevitably, this his line of argument was profoundly ambivalent. This entire study has hinged on the suggestion that a careful, careful analysis of the various shades of gray will do more to enhance our understanding of the dynamics at play here than any attempt to achieve some sort of seemingly unambiguous juxtaposition of anti-Semites and non-anti-Semites. Bax's role in this dispute with Bernstein is another particularly instructive case in point. It is beyond doubt that his remarks are highly problematic and require an explanation. Made today, they would clearly be anti-Semitic. Yet, in their immediate context, any attempt to qualify Bax's remarks in so unambiguous a fashion hinders rather than promotes our understanding of this dispute. Once again, Silbrenner provides us with a telling illustration of the consequences. In Chapter 6, we saw how Silbrenner could find not a word with as much as an anti-Semitic connotation in Leibniz's sustained anti Dreyfusard rat. His conclusion regarding Bernstein's dispute with Bax was similarly clear cut and concise. He flatly stated that on this occasion, Bernstein unjustly accused a socialist of anti Semitism. Okay, as we continue here. Slovasa. Netonic. Okay. Let's take a closer look then. Try to give the shades of gray their due. From what we have already heard, the fundamental ambiguity of Bax's line of argument is evident enough. This, the suggestion that, quote, this, uh, this other, i.e. the Anglo-Saxon race question, unquote, was so much more menacing than, quote, the Jewish question, might seem to ridicule the paranoia of the anti-Semites. Yet, throwing the threat of Anglo-Saxondom into relief by portraying it as more dangerous than the threat posed by Jewry was a strategy that could only work if the latter, too, really was a genuine threat. Quote, to the continual zealot, Bax continued, who raves about the alleged advances of Jewry but sees no significant danger in the advances of Anglo-Saxondom, I say, in the Anglo-Saxon, you are up against Ten Jews. Hm. Well, unquote. Now, if I may be forgiven a gross oversimplification to illustrate the point, ten times zero is zero. <laughs> Much as it may be Bax's primary intention to portray Anglo Saxondom as the greater threat, using this analogy, he can only maintain that it is a threat at all, if the Jews really are a threat too. Well, any sensible reasoning human being backs explain should acknowledge that the predominance of a particular ethnic group will be detrimental because it will also lend prominence to the weak and bad qualities of the ethnic group in question, unquote. Again, the main butt of this of his critique was Anglo-Saxondom, but how did he illustrate the general undesirability 
of the predominance of a particular ethnic group by referring back to the Jews. Quote, the Jews too have many great qualities, but too much Jewry has never done mankind any good. He went on, this much one will surely be able to say without being considered an anti-Semite. I, for my part, cannot find the idea terribly gratifying that control of the world should be divided between two strongly superior ethnic groups, like, for instance, the Anglo-Saxons and the Jews, unquote. Perhaps these remarks were meant ironically, but whatever Bax's intentions, this line of argument clearly played to and reaffirmed the widely accepted notion that the Jews did hold an undue measure of influence. Was there any conceivable sense in which one could suggest even a rough equation between the influence and impact of Jewry on the planet to that of British imperialism, let alone of British and US American imperialism combined? Why introduce this hapless analogy into his critique of Bernstein in the first place then? For Bernstein, the answer was clear. This was an attempt to discredit him by referring implicitly to his Jewish origin. Okay. Another sip. In his rejoinder, Bernstein made no big deal of all this. He mocked the drastic colors in which Bax had portrayed, quote, the threat of the Anglicization of the whole world, unquote, adding simply that Bax had embellished his description, quote, so very tastefully with moderately anti-Semitic remarks, unquote. He really did not understand, Bax now retorted, quote, how anyone could interpret the fact that I, as an Anglo-Saxon, emphasized that there might be too much Anglo-Saxondom in the world, as well as, perhaps, too much Jewry, quote, as a modestly anti-Semitic remark, unquote. I am no anti-Semite and hate the anti-Semites, he then added. It goes without saying that I would have thought twice about making these, to my mind, perfectly harmless remarks had I known that Herr Bernstein was so damn touchy. Bernstein now felt in the defensive. Quote, I made the accusation of moderate anti-Semitism, he explained, quote, because during an earlier polemic, Bax already drew jury into the debate in a manner that was not merited by the matter at hand and could thus be interpreted as anti-Semitic. Consequently, I had to interpret this repetition as an inappropriate attempt to utilize the fact that I am of Jewish extraction and against me. What exactly had transpired during this earlier polemic? Their first dispute back in 1896 had resulted from Bernstein's support for the Armenian cause. The underlying more general issue had been the same for Bernstein. The Armenians were more advanced than the other ethnic, ethnic groups among whom they lived. Hence, it would serve progress if they gained the ascendancy in the areas they populated. From Bax's point of view, anything that weakened the Ottoman Empire only only rendered it more susceptible to Western imperialism and was therefore undesirable. Turning specifically to the Armenians, Max paraphrased the logic of Bernstein's argument as follows, quote, Armenia being a nation of usurers and therefore Kulturfahim, in possession of cultural aptitude, must of course be backed in its national agitation, unquote. The implication was plain enough. Jews are the paradigmatic usurers. Bernstein is a Jew. Little wonder that Bernstein would entertain particular sympathies for a nation of usurers. Ooh. Wow, that came out of the blue. Bernstein did not take up the gauntlet, though, at least not directly. Bax, Bernstein explained in his rejoinder, called them, the Armenians, a nation of usurers. In reality, they are a nation of peasants and artisans, surrounded by semi-barbaric pastoral tribes. In the past, these tribes had been only violent. Now they were extortionists of the worst type. They too have come under the spell of the money system, and, as Bax again can read in Marx, no worse atrocities than those practiced there where semi-barbaric races are drawn inside the circle of the world market. Unimpressed, Bax maintained that, 
contrary to Bernstein's spurious claims, quote, socialists, I repeat, are by no means unanimous in wishing to see an Armenian nationality grow up in which the successful Armenian moneylender may disport himself as a ministerial bigwig for the honor and glory of his country. Okay, I'm tired. Bye. Let's see, stop share. And stop talking.